So today I am going to talk to you about a concept I am terming synthetic ironing. But before I dive into that, I need to address one specific viewer here, very specifically. I hope that you see this. Uh, so the term synthetic irony does not come to me uh, on my own volition. Someone, one of my viewers, uh, emailed me directly. They reached out and they sent me one of the most beautiful emails that I've ever read and I've ever received. They emailed me specifically about HDC or hyperdimensional computing. Upfront, uh, my like my job title is a research scientist, uh, specifically within digital spaces, uh, and and so I deal with digital physics uh, and in in HDC spaces very specifically. Uh, I am under too many NDAs uh, and contractual obligations to respond to your email. I, I can't. Um, I, I I tried. I can't. So um, your email was beautiful. Your research uh, is very beautiful. Uh, I would be significantly interested in uh, exploring the concept of synthetic irony within HDC spaces. Like what you laid out and, and what you're exploring um, is, is the most beautiful thing to me I've ever read. Like I, I wish I could respond to you on it. And so I, all I can do to, to give you justice within this is um, take your concept of, of synthetic irony, um, and I'm gonna apply it in a completely different space than HDC, uh, and uh, I'm gonna give it some life. So thank you. So within this, let's first talk about reinforcement learning as a concept overall. So within reinforcement learning, there's three different algorithms that I want you to focus on. And all of these algorithms are focusing on the reward mechanism. We're gonna dive specifically into that. But imagine you're teaching a dog to uh, new tricks and then you're using treats, you're using rewards, right? Because of the reward mechanism. So you can use three different methods and all three of these are slightly different versus Q learning. So Q learning is like making a cheat sheet for the dog for every single situation. So you say sit, you hold up a treat, etc., and it gets a cheat, like a, a reference of what happened, what, what his reward was during that. And it can reference this cheat sheet over the long run. And then so the, the dog learns by trying things out and updating that cheat sheet based on how many treats it gets. And then it's very focused on finding the absolute best action in every situation, uh, but it can be slow to learn. PPO, on the other hand, or proximal policy optimization, uh, this is like having the dog gradually improve its technique based on what worked well recently. And gradually is important, right? There's a stability built into PPO that is not built into QLearn. So instead of a cheat sheet, the dog remembers a general policy. So if I hear a command, try sitting or shaking. <laughs> it tries variations of this policy, and if a variation of it gets more treats, it updates its policy to do that variation more often. Importantly, PPO only makes small changes to the policy each time, making sure the dog doesn't suddenly forget everything that it learned. This is uh, more flexible than Q-learning, and it can handle more complex tricks in the long run as the dog learns more and more, right? And then you have um, DRPO, which is Diversity Regularized Policy Optimization. This method combines the gradual improvement idea of PPO with an extra ingredient, encouraging the dog to be creative. Imagine not just rewarding the dog for getting treats, but also for trying to different ways to get them, even if they aren't always the most successful. In this instance, very specifically in DRPO, we're adding a secondary reward mechanism on top of the PPO policy, right? So we have uh, the PPO policy reward, and then we're adding essentially this secondary reward, and in different instances, it can play out in different ways, right? So in the DeepSeq R1 paper, they specifically um, utilize this secondary DRPO reward function uh, for uh, rewarding the structure and the model structure and the outputs of the model. But you can adjust this DRPO, uh, uh, this secondary reward function to be whatever you would like. <laughs> it's, it's, this is all mathematics at the end of the day. Uh, and we're talking about mathematical equations. Like if you want to um, change and, and uh, like, make tweaks to a mathematical equation, that's called math. And you should be encouraged to do those things, right? We, we've, uh, to me, kind of grown up in a society that discourages these types of things for some reason. I don't know why, but um, just highlighting that and pointing that out. So then let's dive specifically and deeper into this uh, reinforcement learning concept and, and this irony concept of reinforcement learning, right? So 
with this um, irony concept very specifically what I'm doing is uh, so to me synthetic irony is a um, unique concept that I can inject into this and then so going back to these reward functions they're all focused on deriving the model towards a positive reward, right? But what I know overall about how these models learn, what they're doing, et cetera, they're doing a lot of measurements. They're measuring and they're, they're measuring shapes <laughs> overall, right? Uh, and then so giving them just like the uh, maximum reward doesn't give them the best quote unquote shape to measure. Like it's not... To me, it's a missing data set that they, they would want within this. And what is that missing data set? They would want the exact opposite of what the best is. <laughs> they would want like a, the worst, right? Um, and then it's uh, the exact opposite of the best is a, uh, it's a unique equation in and of itself, right? It's, it's like the literal polar opposite as far as you can get away from uh, th the goal. <laughs> and then so that has to be calculated. And then once you calculate that, you can calculate anything as far as the distance in between uh, the goal and that distance, right? And then so this is a counterintuitive concept overall, and then I think of it counterintuitively. But then when I think of this, um, my first reaction is, is what would happen if I train a model on this, like an, an agent on this counterintuitive reward, right? Like So not just a positive reward, but a um, like that secondary reward, a DRPO reward function that is to measure like the worst reward, <laughs> like the worst outcome, right? And 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 we'll give it like kind of just like a, a less weighted average. But what would happen? Would the model still learn? Would it still do things? Um, and then so I, the very first thing I do is I, I just set up a simple experiment to, to run this, right? Uh, and then what I see is that the, the model is still still learning, like it's still triggering its 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 rewards. Um, in this instance. So this is, to me, a positive sign, right, and a positive outcome. And I can see it's, it's actions, so it's, it's just state actions. This, to me, is like the first initial setup that I could do, right? Uh, I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> this actually works, and so I can I can build a state. And then let me take it a step further, and then I'm going to, like, like mouse cheese game is, if you're familiar with reinforcement learning, mouse cheese game is, like, um, kind of a, like a popular next step here. And so that's what I do uh, for this, right? Um, and then so just typical mouse cheese game and typical mouse cheese game using proximal policy optimization. And then what we can see under this is utilizing PPO, the mouse shoots directly for the cheese, right? So the mouse is the green, and it's starting at the upper left, uh, and then it just goes straight down and then to the right. Like, it, it beelines for that cheese in the best way that it can. The cheese is the yellow, obviously. Uh, and then those, like, dark blues are obstacles within it, so it, it can't go that way. Um, and then so it, it chooses the, the most optimal way to, to go within this path, and it figures that out pretty quickly, right? And then so let's now, from here, so this is all expected. Now let's, from here, um, inject and then see what happens when we uh, like inject this uh, synthetic irony policy and, and this and synthetic irony concept into this. And then something unique happens here. <laughs> what happens is... Da, 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 da. So we get um, this metric here, right, which is cool, uh, and then this metric here, which is interesting. Um, this dip, this, these dips, I, I can't account for those dips very specifically, um, but like this is is uh, an, a very interesting result to me. Uh, this is a fascinating result to me. So uh, we have uh, the, again the agent is the green, so the path that it took, it explored half the map. Uh, and then they explored the half of the map where, so we have our cheese, our cheese goal, right? Uh, and then our synthetic irony goal. And then the synthetic irony goal is the exact opposite placement of the cheese. Um, and then so we can see that that synthetic irony goal encourages exploration in this instance. It's the agent still reaches the cheese <laughs> and then it still uh, follows the same like a uh, number of steps uh, within this total sequence, but it re it explores its region, it doesn't beeline for the cheese. Getting a model to do this is actually very hard, right? Like this is a hard concept to pull off. So I'm happy with this output. Like this means that um, synthetic irony is doing something within this instance. It's, it's allowing the model to explore this solution space better. And this is an outcome that I often want, right? Because within this solution space, within any of these solution spaces, when we're doing a reinforcement learning, the, the problem is like I don't ever know what the uh, optimal reward is or or where the the optimal reward is within this space right I want the model to figure that out 
And then so within this, I'm encouraging the model to um, explore more space, which is like, like typically there's a trade-off, right? You have a trade-off between um, exploration uh, and, and like a goal and, and goal-oriented behavior. And these are the two levers that you can pull with reinforcement learning, right? Um, and then typically if you pull that like that creative letter, that, that exploration lever, then your goal exploration goes down, your goal-orientedness goes down. But this is... Um, kind of like working around that, right? It's allowing us to uh, increase that creative measure and that exploration, but our goal-oriented behavior still remains. So this is a unique algorithm within this particular instance as to how this synthetic irony ends up functioning here. Uh, and then we compared this, right? So uh, I compare it to to PPO. Uh, as a, So this is all within Q learning up front. And then so very important, right? Uh, when I apply this function here, to Q learning, this is the result. So when I apply synthetic irony to Q learning, we get increased exploration. Now I do the same thing for uh, PPO, and I do my initial test, and I get a different response. Like a, this is an unexpected result, right? Uh, this to me is like a, essentially showing that this uh, synthetic irony isn't really having an impact. And then so uh, I take it a step further, and then let me see, like, and graph it out, right? So uh, I do it here, uh, and then. It, there's no result. <laughs> like uh, my initial test was was the heat map, and it just beelined, just like it did before, right? Um, so I wanted to know, so how, like, what, how is it beelining? Uh, and it's just it's going like, I mean, straight towards the end there, right? Like it, it's uh, the end or nothing else, basically, uh, as you can see, uh, which is very interesting, right? Like it's it's um, uh, it's not exploring the 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 space, like so this. Um, for whatever reason, synthetic irony is not taking hold within this. It's not allowing the model to to generalize here. So in the next instance, I, I, I like I crank it to eleven, right? So I'm like, okay. In the first instance, the synthetic irony reward is like half of the goal oriented reward. Let me double. Let me make the synthetic irony reward double what the goal oriented reward is. Um, and it, I mean, it has like an impact here because it it. it uh, takes a second before going to the goal, uh, and then it just goes to the goal. Uh, but like, it ends up going to the goal more in this instance. You can see it, it ends up at the cheese 21 times in this instance, whereas it ends up in the cheese 18 times in this instance. So, so like this actually, actually increases its goal-orientedness, and it does slightly increase the, the um, learning rate within this, right? So uh, there is a another experiment that I as I could have cut this experiment off too early, and I do do this sometimes within my experience highlighting this, right? Like, uh, what I didn't do is I didn't, like, grok out this experiment. So I didn't, like, turn that synthetic irony dial up to, like, 100, literally, right? Like, may, so with this behavior here, what we're seeing is that there is a possibility and, and a probability that it could occur that if I had grokked this out, like, if I had cranked up that synthetic irony to 100, that we might have gotten, uh, like, a, a, an emergent property out of this, like, something unexpected, right? Because this is unexpected. It's unexpected to me that it's hitting the cheese 21 times uh, as opposed to 18 times uh, in this instance. Like, it's getting, like, more goal-oriented, but it's, uh, uh, like, creativeness, it's, its ability to to explore is increasing slightly like by one, <laughs> literally by one, right? Um, but, uh so <clears throat> that is an interesting result. And then perhaps rocking this out, like cranking that up to 11, could do something within this. And then so highlighting that overall, right? But I want to highlight and end with a few things here. The first thing is, is that, so what we've learned with this synthetic irony that we've put in here is that this works very specifically and it's a allows what from our experimentation here further and more um, curiosity from Q learning. So from a Q learning agent, very specifically, if you employ this synthetic irony approach, you're going to get great results. Uh, if you employ it to PPO, probably not so much. There's a possibility that you could grok it out um, and get further gains there. But this synthetic irony is, <clears throat> to me, a bottom line. Like, I, I, it's the counterintuitive approach, and it's a, like the counterintuitive approach is often important within AI overall, and that's often where you get experiments and gains, right? Like, like uh, so there's, I mean, we've explored kind of the, the intuitive spaces in all of these things, right? And there's still questions that remain. And then so the questions that remain are obviously somewhere within the counterintuitive spaces. That's how I look at this equation overall. Uh, if you like this topic content, please like and subscribe.